Nice to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for doing this on yeah. our, our Labor Day back. Sure. Uh, let's start with what the, the, the content of the film. You, the, you've said this film was inspired by a, a real-life event, uh, the abduction of a young boy from a park in Victoria, B.C. in the early 90s. Yeah. What was it about that story that stayed with you all these years? Well, the fact that he's still missing, the fact that the parents are still looking for him, still believe he's going to return. And, you know, that was one of the things that uh, that started this journey. But the other one was, uh, of course, the, the Cornwall pedophile ring, you know, with the results of that, which were released in 2009, the largest public inquiry ever in, in, in Ontario's history. Um, where there was a, a, a group of victims and there was clearly something that happened in Cornwall, though no one quite figured out what. And it was so mysterious and so 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 shrouded in in, in unresolved answers and like questions and, and and at all times I was thinking about the people involved. Like what does it mean to actually feel that you're living with something that's so unresolved and so cataclysmic to your experience. And so these Three couples emerged as I started writing this and formulating this. The, the, the parents of a child who had, who had gone missing, um, uh, two detectives who are working on this case and form a relationship as they're working on this case. One of them becomes very obsessive about it, his line of work and, um, and, and veers off course. And, of course, then uh, the pedophile who's stolen a child kept her captive for, for uh, nine years and seen her transform into an adult, so right. no longer... Um, uh, so a focus of his sexual attention, but it becomes an odd couple as well. So these three couples um, are at the basis of this. Yes, it was based on these these real life events. And when did you know you wanted to make this film? Oh, uh, I didn't for a long time. I wrote a, a first draft about six years ago, and it just seemed to be so dark, and I just didn't know if I wanted to enter into that world. And uh, the more I did my research, you know, just it it seems so overwhelming. Um, and yet, you know, these characters, and in particular the, the father, who is somehow uh, made the object of suspicion um, because he did leave his daughter alone uh, in a car. Uh, we understand as the viewer what happened, but it's not so clear for the detectives. And living with that, uh, living with the guilt of, of having done something, but something that anyone could understand, any parent right. has left a child alone. But that... When, when I started thinking of that role... When I started for a thinking, brief, for 30 seconds. So really, yeah, and, yeah. and she's 10 years old, and, yeah. and we understand it all, but we also understand uh, the mechanics of what happens in the moments after uh, an event like that and what the police have to do and what the, what the lingering consequence of that is. So all of that, you know, you, you live with these stories, and, and, and then um, you begin to... Uh, you do research and, and you go a certain way and then you're pulled back into another place and then you start thinking of actors and, and it becomes clearer in your mind and that's what happened. This was like a four-year process of writing. It. The father is played by Ryan Reynolds. He's mm -hmm. at the forefront of this film and, mm -hmm. and, and really he was just, he's quite remarkable, his yeah. performance in this and maybe we'll get to that. It's interesting to hear you say, I, I wasn't sure about it when I started six years ago because the, the material is so dark right. because... You are Adam McGoy, and, yeah. and I, I know you face this question over and over again, but you've made a number of films that address abductions, right. abuse, or, or how loss yeah. affects families and communities. I'm thinking Felicia's Journey, right. I'm thinking, I'm thinking the, the Sweet Hereafter, I'm thinking The Devil's Not. Right. What is it about that kind of subject matter that keeps you coming back as a filmmaker? I, I guess I'm really interested in characters that are overwhelmed by their circumstance, who um, are trying to maintain some sort of... Um, course, you know, in, 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 a, in a sea of things that are just so turbulent and so violent. And of course, this starts usually in, in families and, and something in the way we um, are, uh, are taught about the world. But then that intersects with all sorts of unforeseen circumstances that are just thrown in our direction. And I've, I've just experienced that like most other people and I've witnessed it, seen it. And, uh, Yes, I, I guess it's one of the other reasons why I hesitated because I, 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 I am using these types of narrative lines which are which recur. And I, I, I would like to think that I can uh, tell these stories about someone who's experienced such piercing joy 
that they're disoriented. Right, right. But I haven't quite figured that out. Right. I mean, I don't know if uh, Joy actually... But like a musician who keeps keeps going back to the same three bar chords, you yeah. know, and worry, you might worry about, well, I've already done that. Do you, do, where, where's the line for you about becoming an Adam McGoyan parody of himself? It, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I think that uh, you try and, and find, you know, different ways of telling these stories. And also you try and experiment with, you know, the alchemy of working with different actors and uh, becoming more ambitious. I think this is a very ambitious film in terms of uh, all the balls that it's sort of throwing into the air. I think it's making huge, you know, demands on the viewer. Um, it, it, it's, it's very multi-layered in terms of how it's working with time, but I also think it's very rewarding at the end. It's, it's, it, it, it's very, um, I mean, the, the, the viewer is re rewarded for what they're bringing, you know, to, into the experience. But you just keep trying to refine and, and, and raise these issues because there are obviously the issues that you're, that you're living with. There are obviously the things that you're obsessed with. And uh, uh, the question is, you know, you have to be true to yourself. You really do. You know, like you, you, you could think there's a certain type of film you'd, you'd want to make. I, when I do the operas or when I do, uh, you know, the theater or the installation or do these other side projects, uh, I can sort of like when I did the Mozart opera, yeah. like that was just great because it was just a whole different sort of, you know, musical environment yeah. and it was just silly and it was fun and, and I really welcome that it was like delightful um and i would you know leap at the opportunity to do that again but when it comes you're a to baseball star having fun on the tennis court or yeah something, something yeah. like that i mean uh or in my case maybe a cricket star but anyway because <laughs> i was raised in victoria and they still played cricket at that time but okay. but uh but yeah but i i do think that you know there's there's a type what it comes down to as far as a director is there's a type of discussion you're having with your actors there's a certain type of uh way that you are able to uh, create a character. And I find, and maybe the reason why I think actors really enjoy working with me is because it's, it's very detailed and it has to do with, you know, trying to understand um, what their, what their, where the levels of resistance are and what it is that they're up against and what it is they're trying to do. Here you have a couple played by Ryan Reynolds and Murray Enos who really love each other. They have this perfect family life and suddenly it's, 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 it's thrown in this complete upheaval by the unimaginable. Right. And how do they negotiate a relationship? You know, we gather that over the course of eight years they're not living together, but they still love each other. Uh, but, but they haven't, they haven't even seen each other possibly, mm -hmm. except, you know, through the film, we get the sense that they're still connected, but we don't quite know in reality how connected they are. And that energizes you more than the wondrous magic of love, for example. But I think that's part of the wondrous magic well, of I, love. I, I, but you know, but how mean, about the... <laughs> no, but it is. It is. At courting rather than at abduction, at, 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 uh, at falling in love for the first time. I'm well, thinking of something enough, really... I mean, I mean, you have these detectives who are falling in love, but in the, uh, through the most gruesome sort of set of circumstances, they're falling in love over this ab abduction case. We don't really understand what the courtship is. We understand at a certain point in the film that they formed a relationship, but we also understand how that relationship is up against its challenges yes. as well. One of the detectives, played by Scott Speedman, becomes completely obsessed by this ring. And as I did my investigation into pedophile... Um, rings and, and police detectives, you understand that there is a real obstacle. Uh, you know, in other uh, circumstances, when a police officer goes undercover, when they're, you know, uh, investigating crime or uh, drugs or, you know, they're allowed to handle some, some of the material in order to uh, support their undercover activities. When it comes to child porn, the detectives cannot. They cannot use real children. They cannot use real images of children. So how they enter into these rings or how do they actually uh, become... Uh, able to do their work becomes, you know, very mysterious. I mean, in all okay. the investigations, I'm not understanding that. So this is about a detective who goes rogue, I mean, in a weird way. Let and me see if I can come back to that. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <'cause, 'cause laughs> I, I want to get to the, the, the reaction to the film. Yeah. I, I can, in yeah, particular. Sure. And I, and I want to mention to people that you and I spoke last week, right. where we were we had a dialogue, and, and where I said, you, you know, you were invited to come on the show, and, yeah. and, and that we were going to, if you were going to come on, we would talk about... Sure. Um, the difficult reaction this this film yeah. got, and by the way, having seen the film, the reaction at, at both sides, the polarizing reactions is is somewhat of a, a mystery to me. Right, I mean, right. it, it it does seem like it was really extreme and it's yeah. and kind of strange. So I'm I'm actually very curious to get your t thoughts on this. But but you uh, generously agreed to come in, not you, right. you said we don't have to do the interview you, you, to come in and and talk about the fact that I mean, for better or worse, the reaction it can can influence uh, the narrative of any film. 
film. The crowds right. are boisterous and they're known for leaping to their feet in support or booing in, right, in, right. in, in dissent. And, and reports out of this year's festival yeah. told the la- of the latter right, happening right. after a press screening of The Captive. So uh, why did you feel comfortable wanting to talk about it with me? Well, because also, I'm still trying to figure out the reaction myself. Um, you have to understand that it's a very intense day. I'll just give you sort of like the framework of what happens when you premiere a film in Cannes. Is that, first of all, you're invited, which is great. You're one of 18 films right. from around the world. And this was an amazing year for Canada because we had three films in competition. Unheard of. You, uh, Cronenberg, Xavier yeah, Dolan. Yes. Yeah. It was an incredible year. Uh, I went up first. And, um, you know, what happens is that, first of all, the festival selected the film very early on, they, right after they saw it, which w- would have been in February. Very unusual. They just loved the film. And they gave it a, a, a primo slot Friday night. Um, and all indications were that this was going to go incredibly well from uh, uh, an advanced uh, screening for, you know, select press and everything was pointing towards something that was going to be uh, really exciting. It had been um, uh, 25 years since I'd been in Cannes with my third feature, 20 years since Exotica, all the sort of stuff in my mind I was building up. And then that morning happened where there's a press screening at 8 a.m. Uh, over, what, 2,500 members of the international press crowd into the, this huge theater to watch the, the film. I'm not there. So I don't actually know what happened okay. in the screening. But, of course, as I uh, arrived at the press conference afterwards, the publicist said, uh, you know, don't, don't go on your uh, tweet account. Don't, don't, don't look at social media. And I was going, well, what had happened is that even before the film had, had finished, you know, there were tweets being sent out. And that's the world we live in right now. Yeah. I just ask Rebecca Black, I guess. So, you know, like, you know, you just, you're, there's this immediate crazy response. Right. And it just, it just goes from there. And so I was aware over the course of the day that this had been uh, a, a kind of catastrophic press screening. Um, I was getting, uh, uh, you know, you just get the sense from the press conference, even though it was very well attended, you just got a sense from the questions, you got a sense from the type of interviews you were having. So I prepped my actor saying, when we go to the premiere tonight, it may really be rocky. What happened at the premiere, uh, which wasn't reported, was that it was one of the best screenings I've had. Like there was like, a, you know, a sustained standing ovation and there were no boos. Um, and it was Great. It was like really couldn't have gone better. But the but story the that came day, out though, of Cannes, of course, the story that comes never, out. Of, I, I mean, had you gotten raves from the press, it would right. not have gotten as much no. attention as the story which which Adam McGoin's film has been panned or right. got booed. Which is which is still this thing which I'm trying to understand because uh, I watched the film. I, I've shot another film which I just finished uh, last week, um, and so before this interview and before you know what I have to do now in terms of promoting it, I watched the film again with a bit of distance. And I'm really super proud of it. I just think it's 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 very, uh, it's it's demanding, um, and it is dealing with very very tricky subject material. No question about that. And as I always try and do in my films, I'm trying to show these characters from the point of view of how they see themselves. So the pedophile does not see himself as this kind of. Uh, you know, uh, uh, villainous sort of um, kind of like, you know, he sees himself as a suave, you know, guy living in this designer home. And he um, has this attitude about himself, which is unexpected. Um, All the people, that's always what I try and do is to find a way of representing these characters as they see themselves. That might be very upsetting. And some people might find that uh, incredibly um, uh, audacious, or they might find it just, you know, outright, you know, offensive. I mean, but that's my style. I mean, I, that's how I make my movies. But it wasn't I... just a, about the pedophile. The, I mean, first of all, I should say the film has its admirers. Right. There was a four-star rave in, in the Telegraph. Right. Uh, but Variety, IndieWire, The Hollywood Reporter, The Guardian, all panned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Peter Bradley and The Guardian, sorry to bring this up. Yeah, sure. He wrote, the film was bizarrely acted, bizarrely written, bizarrely directed, bizarre, and bizarrely completely culpably misjudged. Now, you said in an interview the day after the, of that press screening that you've got a thick skin, which I was right, right. Uh, proud of you for. Yeah. Because and, and 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 within days, by the way, there was a, a waterkeeper benefit, and you you yeah. you were at it, sure. and I saw you, and you even played the guitar and yeah. sang, yeah. which uh, which I would think would be more, far more tricky for, right. <laughs> than than debuting a film at Cannes. So you were back and and at it, but uh, but how much of a thick skin is needed to be? I mean, I guess how Pretty painful thick. was it for those reviews? Really painful. But then again, I I've always had had like detractors in a way I'm kind of lucky because my first features were not well not well received you know I, I, I wasn't one of these filmmakers who kind of emerged with a first feature that's like the second coming uh, you know my first feature 30 years ago 
uh, was kind of famously not reviewed by the Globe and Mail upon its release because they thought it, they deemed it unworthy. So I went. I realized from the very beginning, like there were going to be challenges, and uh, I I have had a thick skin. This was. This was actually unexpected. That's what I found kind of shocking about it because I did suffer from, I would say, more than a mild dose of hubris going in. I actually felt that this was my moment. Um, I felt r super proud of the film and the actors were all there to support and it. And how much did this get you down? Uh, it just, it confuses you and then you think, uh, uh, well, what does that mean when they say that it's, it's bizarrely misjudged? Because I'm not sure what it is that, that they're... What are the standards that they're applying? And um, I think that this film is very unusual. It's 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 taking chances. It's doing all the things that you're supposed to do as an artist, and it's not following conventions. There are genre elements in it, but it is uh, wildly unexpected in terms of uh, how it's presented tonally. You know, the things that you think you're supposed to be reacting to, uh, your are, are are misplaced or are kind of. Um, there's 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 an alchemy that's that's somehow unexpected, and what I really wanted to get at was this sense of pervasive um, creepiness and and dislocation, and you know how um, that sense of absence uh, haunts you, and how do you repair that? When you said you rewatched it recently, was mm -hmm. there any sense in you that you could have been more sensitive around the topic of child abduction? Was uh, that something? No, is that something it, you worry? About? I, I have to say, I, I I can understand how the film could have been presented uh, to be, you know, uh, you know, simpler. But that's not what the project was. The project, with all of the films I've done, is to is to try and push things as far as you can. And 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 it's not just done capriciously. It's done because that's how I see these stories. And and I feel that uh, emotionally. And I know that there's a a group of collaborators I'm working with. You know, between Paul Sarasi and Michael Dana. Doing the music and you know uh, uh, you know the uh, your team by the way team. you've worked with throughout For, the years throughout. so for so, all the so, successes so, so, yeah. and I feel that this is something that you know I I bring to the table and certainly when the film is invited into that sort of forum and uh, when it's given that sort of place you think that you are being consecrated but you forget sometimes that you are first of all extraordinary fortunate to be in that place which is that the film is getting a ton of attention. 2,500 members of the international press are seeing it. Mm. And that something is going to happen in that room. Uh, and I've been at the other end of it. I've been on the, the jury there, and I've you know been to other screenings where you can feel uh, that there is something amiss. What happened here? I've never experienced this. I've had films which, as you said, have been like, you know, praised to the skies. I've had films which have had kind of a neutral response, respectful. But uh, what I found odd about this was how, uh, dare I say, disrespectful a lot of the reviews mm -hmm. were. Like they were just there to kind of attack uh, this whole project. And, you know, I've been doing this for so long that that is not something I'm vulnerable to. I've committed my life to making these films and, um, you know, no review that says, uh, uh, you know, I shouldn't be doing this or I shouldn't be there is something I can take seriously. Well, I there was also really an, hard a, an element of calling an Adam McGuire film bizarre that was sort of... Uh, Really? Have you, <laughs> yeah. Are you aware, aware of his catalog? This is, uh, I mean, that, and, that must have been interesting for you to suddenly be called it's also bizarre. Perhaps, right? perhaps these people are too uh, aware of my catalog as well. I mean, with the, the hope with this film, uh, and certainly, you know, one of the ideas that, and how we're releasing it is that there are a lot of people who m perhaps haven't seen one of my films before and that this might be an introduction. And so, right. so, so for as much as we can say that there are uh, ideas and um, you know, themes that, I've coming, uh, that I'm coming back to, I'm also working on a palette that hopefully will connect to a different sort of public because I think that you know, we do have this amazing grounding performance with Ryan Reynolds who's doing something quite exceptional, something that uh, I think is bringing a whole new color to his range and uh, he's magnificent. So hopefully- Does, does the critic Critical reaction matter. I mean, I, you know, when the film co in, in the circles of your films. I mean, I know earlier this summer, Teenage Mutant Ninja Tur Tur Turtles got panned by critics, yeah. and or for the most part, and then right. went on to rage in yeah. the, at the box office. Uh, does it matter in this case? And 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 how do you go about reclaiming the narrative of your own film after it gets this kind of negative critical reception? Here's the does? thing: is that is that in terms of my own career, it's mattered a lot. I'll be honest with you. I mean, um, the the critical attention that my films were given early on was very important to me. And uh, especially, you know, the, it wasn't coming from this country. Because it, it you was, cared or because it helped you in the industry? Because it, it was a validation. 
And I think that uh, uh, I, I put a lot of weight on that. And what, I've, what I'm coming to understand, Xion, and it's very, very uh, troubling, but I have to understand it, is that it doesn't mean as much as it used to. Um, that we're de dealing with a different type of criticism. It's a criticism of aggregates. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it, it's not, uh, there was a time when, uh, and I could, there were certain reviews that turned the career of one of the films around. Uh, and, and I could tell you the review that did that with Exotica, the review of the Sweet Hereafter, Felicia's Journey, Ararat, you know, there were reviews that kind of changed perspective, put uh, a, a film into uh, a certain focus and was able to create a discussion around it. Now, yes, you did mention these great reviews in the Telegraph or the Times. Um, will those be enough to actually create some sort of debate around this or what the intentions of the film was and why it wasn't misjudged? In fact, it's very carefully judged. It's very, uh, it's very very, very uh, carefully considered. I, I don't know. Um, it's a different culture, and I'm and I'm really coming. I think over over these past four months, that's what I've, I've I've come to understand is that we're living in a different time than when I started making films 30 years ago. I mean, yeah, surprise, surprise. Of <laughs> course we are, but I, I do think that um, people that, weren't, that's weren't a very tweeting good from the theater. Right? Yeah. Do these critic do, do these reviews matter? I've uh, I've had to I've had to wean myself off of. Um, these reviews and these critics because I understand there are other agendas. I also have come to understand that you're in a festival so that, you know, where the film is placed in the festival, the fact that it was uh, up after this disastrous opening night film, that there were a lot of questions about, you know, what the selection was about and whether or not there were just a, like the old favorites returning into this 18 uh, film competition and that many of the reviews were, were talking about that, that I was there because I'd been there before. Now that's a patently absurd because there are a lot of filmmakers who have been there before who are not right, invited, right, right. and so they're very, they have very high standards, but it becomes part of the, uh, you know, you're a, you're a big dog uh, a, in, uh, in that in that venue, and, 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 and it's and easier and to, if, yeah. because there's such a, uh, there's so much stuff to sort through. There's so many films. There's so many uh, uh, television shows. There's so many books. There's so much new music. If something can be dismissed, um, that hmm. has a certain convenience, right? So because it doesn't have to then be engaged, and I think that. What's, what's challenging is we make a film like The Captive, which is designed to be engaged, which actually takes time and it's almost, um, I'm, 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 I'm so, I have such high expectations of my viewer and I'm expecting that they are completely committed and that they trust what my, what my methods are. Um, if, if, if the critic finds that, that, that they have three other films to see that day um, and that one of them can be dismissed, then there's a great temptation. And when they're in a room, and again, I wasn't in that room, but if there's an overwhelming sense that this is a film that can be dismissed, uh, then there's a gang mentality. Well, I hope people see it. And, and part of the reason, I mean, you, you make this film knowing it's not going to be a walk in the park for the viewer. I right. mean, it's going to be controversial. And, and that is one of the reasons people should see it. And they yeah. can decide for themselves. And the, another reason they should see it is Ryan Reynolds, which we will get back to at this point, we, uh, uh, who... I mean, he's more, he, he is more, he's done some serious stuff, but he really he's known for the comedic work right. and the sort of hunky star in the, in the big bu budget action films, uh, uh, and more recently Green Lantern and, and Blade Three. You, you said at the time uh, in, in Cannes, this will completely redefine Ryan Reynolds' career. And if you see the film, um, he's remarkable in a very different kind of role than we've seen right. him in in the past. Uh, do you still think it'll redefine his career? Uh, if the film gets uh, the attention I think it deserves, yes, because I think what he uh, what he be, what he does towards the end of the film um, is so extraordinary. Um, when you know these extraordinary odds are against him, he's been living with this for eight years. Uh, when he, through these very mysterious circumstances, the abduction to, of his child, yes, yeah, the abduction yeah. of his child. Uh, when he's able to reconnect and when he's given this glimmer of that, that there'd be some possibility of saving her, uh, the, the way that's done and the, um, the things he has to negotiate and, and prove to himself um, and his ability to rise to that morally, uh, he embraces that so incredibly. Like I was, I was just in tears when I saw him do this one take, which I just felt... Yes, I was witnessing an actor uh, go into a zone that I'd never seen them uh, approach before, and he knew that, and we both kind of celebrated this moment, and it was really, 
rare. And that's why you make films. You make films because you have a camera there and it is able to catch that mm. and it's able to, you know, um, situate that and, and, and make that such an essential part of this story you're telling. And it's, it's such an exciting medium. It's, it's, uh, but you have to take these chances. He had to take the chance to play this role. He had to commit himself to it. You know, I, I, I told the story I, I, you know, in the way I needed to tell it. It's just, it's, so that's, you know, overall, Yes, it is tough to go through a day like we had in Cannes, but it's such a privilege to be making films, and I, I'm so grateful that I get to make these films. And, and uh, so if, if this is the cost of it, it it's, it's really inconsequential, I would say, in the grand scheme of things, as painful as it was that day. I, mean, I could tell you a very funny story about what happened that day, you know, where I... I um, uh, my, 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 my jacket literally caught on fire. I think I might have told you this. <laughs> no, you didn't tell me this. <laughs> well, I, I, I went into this, uh, you know, uh, when I found out what the, the magnitude of the, uh, uh, of the response was, I, I went into this washroom and I just felt <laughs> sick to my stomach and I had to just stare in the mirror and splash cold water on my face. And it was one of these, you know, hotel kind of boutique, sort of like trendy, kind of like dark washrooms. And at a certain point as I'm staring at myself and going, okay, just you bear with it. You have to be tough. You have to go back into that room. You have to face the journalist. And that's not the smell of, you know, your jacket burning. And I was going, oh, how interesting. I'm actually in the middle of a nightmare and I'm looking at, at my jacket and it's actually on flames. And I was going, oh, this is so bizarre. I've never actually been in a nightmare. Nightmare. And then my arm felt, in the, of course, there was a little candle right beside the, the sink, and my jacket had caught fire. And at which point, wow. I kind of like flung it off, and uh, the smoke alarms went off, and uh, these beefy French security guards came like rushing in, and they were like going, "What? What's happening?" And and I, I just went, "It doesn't matter what's happening. Just you know." And they said, "What?" what uh, they started stomping on the jacket to put out the fire, and I just calmly left, and I and I did my press interviews without the jacket. Without the jacket, my wow. the publicist, the same one who kind of told me not to tweet, kind of went, "What happened to your jacket?" And I said, "It's a long story." <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Oh my God! What a so yeah, it was a dramatic. Quite a in day. Way, it was yeah. a dramatic day. Uh, <laughs> if you look at the press conference pictures, you'll see the jacket. And something told me intuitively that I shouldn't have worn it because it's slightly too decorative for my taste. <laughs> and I had a little bit too much, you know, like there's like little ornaments on it. And I was going, okay, I'll wear it, you know, screw it. And see? I was, Yahweh I was intervened. That's what. Right. Yeah. Well. Um, <laughs> You asked me how the day was. Yeah, well, I got it. I got it. Thank you. I mean, I'm this is a, a Q exclusive. I didn't even know that. That's quite a story about the jacket. Um, the captive opens in theaters across Canada this Friday. I, I should, uh, I should mention you, you, you before I let you go. There's so much. You've just finished shooting with Chris, yeah. Chris Pl Plummer and Sault Ste. Marie. But I also want to mention that the captive won't be shown at TIFF. But you have another project. You're restoring one of your earlier films, Speaking, Speaking Parts, Parts yeah. which the, is also a weirdly enough a film about surveillance in hotel rooms. Well, and what's it like, like to go back and, and do that, I mean, pour over that, that work? Um, for it was really interesting given what, you know, like the similarity. I mean, when you talk about there, there, are, there are real echoes between the two films, but it also makes you, um, like that was a certain period when you got to make these types of films, which were so um, odd. And, and uh, it, it brought back, it was great. And it also was shot on 35 millimeter film, so it looks amazing. And I'm excited about that. That's screening uh, on the first weekend of the festival. So it will be weird. I'm opening um, uh, Captive on the 5th, and on the next day is, uh, is, is a special screening of Speaking Parts, which is now 25 years old. Yes. Well, it's and, great. And, I, and I'll be very careful about the jacket please, I'm wearing. Please, please be careful I, with I, your jacket. I, I, will, I, will, uh, I, will, uh, I will I will wear a very plain, unornamented jacket that day. Thank you for coming in, dealing with those questions, and thank you for uh, the candor, as always. Okay, thanks, Yeah.